Are your suet feeders empty? And you're worried about your birds starving. But you can't go anywhere because there was an ice storm? And it's just not safe to go to the store right now? Yes, that's oddly specific. Well, don't worry, because the birds will probably be fine with all the natural food sources they've used for millions of years. But if you'd like to give them a little leg up and make you feel better at the same time, we can make our own suet and your own suet feeder. First, let's make some suet. You'll need vegetable shortening, cornmeal, peanut butter, heck, let's throw some sunflower seeds and mealworms in there too. You can even mix in some bird seed. We're using an adaptation of the Marvel Meal from Penn State Extension. Begin by melting your shortening and then let it cool off a bit before adding it to the other ingredients. Next, we'll mix all of our yummy ingredients together. Mmm, this looks delicious. If I was a woodpecker. Let that cool and harden. Another note, watch out when placing suet out during warm weather, as the higher temperatures can make some recipes turn rancid. Next, let's transform a log into a suet feeder. I bet you've got lots of fallen limbs after that ice storm. Golly, I, I sure do. Now, we could smear the suet mix directly on the log, but we could fit even more by drilling some holes into the wood first. Use whatever large high-speed or paddle drill bit that you have on hand. It's time to figure out a way to hang this. We're going to use an eye bolt screw. Pre-drill your hole to make it easier, and then screw in the eye bolt. Use a screwdriver to give you more leverage. Now, let's slather that log in some homemade suet. Yum, yum, yummy, yum. Hey, Pooch, stay back. This is for the birds. Well, we're almost done. Now it's time to find a sturdy limb or a garden hook to hang your new suet log feeder. Now you can rest assured that you help give the birds some extra calories to get through this cold stretch of weather. Thank you, strange disembodied voice. You're welcome. And as always, keep on growing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists, Horticulturist, can't even say it today, uh, here to answer your gardening questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the um, State Master Gardener Specialist here for U of I Extension, and I'm based in Bloomington, so Central Illinois based like the rest of us. But we are glad to be here to talk all about gardening. And today, specifically, we're going to talk about gardening trends that we think are going to show up this year. So a great way to kick off the year. I, in particular, love to chat about anything flower related, so cut flowers, annuals, and perennials. But my co-hosts here like to touch on other gardening topics. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Alsop. I'm a horticulture educator for University of Illinois Extension based out of Bloomington. And my specialty uh, on our team is integrated pest management, and uh, which means I know how to scout and find and kill insects, 
but I spend the majority of my time looking for all those good insects like the butterflies and the beneficial insects. And that is my specialty. Go ahead. <laughs> Email me a question about bugs. <laughs> Um, and I'm Ryan Panko, a horticulture educator out of Champaign. And my specialty is trees and shrubs. You know, our boroculture and forestry is kind of what I've got most of my experience and training in, but I also like native plants. And, you know, whether it's for your home landscape or a restoration scale, native planting, I'm into that. And also, um, I'm an amateur vegetable gardener. So I, I do a lot of that, but I, I don't claim to be an expert at vegetable gardening. Anyway, awesome. so I'd like to talk about all those topics. Perfect. Yeah. So we cover quite a few areas amongst the amongst the three of us. But like I mentioned, today our topic is uh, 2022 trends, gardening trends. So hit us up in the comment box below and let us know if you have any trends you think are going to be popping up in the gardening world today. We're going to talk through quite a few of them today. So definitely let us know if you have some ideas or also if you have any questions. If you have houseplant questions, any type of gardening questions, we are happy to help and we'll take those as they come through in the um, comment box. So we're going to kick it off, I think, just by chatting about, obviously, one of the big trends we think is going to continue this year is just the gardening craze in general, uh, right? Would you guys agree? I think we saw oh, yeah. a lot of that through the pandemic that we noticed a lot of folks who maybe weren't gardeners before picked up gardening because maybe they had more time on their hands or they just had the the drive to be outside. Um, and I think just based on what we're all seeing in the industry is that that seems like it's going to continue. And I just read a study that talked about how gardening can create emotional resilience, um, meaning you feel a little bit closer to nature then it makes you recover faster and you feel a little closer to um, your family and a little bit less stress. And, you know, I think at a, the day, the day, the time it is, we all are looking for, you know, that little extra outlet. So I think the therapeutic part of gardening is only going to grow and people are going to start understanding it more. I think we understand it a lot. Because, you know, Ryan, Candace, and I are it, literally dying right now because we can't do anything mm -hmm. other than our house plants. So that's why the house plants keep multiplying. Um, because yeah, we're I like looking your... for that connection. We're looking for <laughs> that emotional um, connection to the plants. Yeah. I liked your comment on email earlier this week, Kelly, of go away winter. I mean, that that's <laughs> how we kind of ended a plant discussion. Like, Great point. Yeah, we're ready to yeah. get out and do some things in the field. And gosh, I, I really think that's an overlooked benefit of gardening is that health and emotional aspect. And just, I mean, if not just exercise and physical, like doing stuff, but that, that mental way to uncheck from everything that you're doing and be around some plants and get some fresh air. I mean, it's just a huge benefit that I think is overlooked. Yeah, 100%. And when you get something to flower or seed or produce, I mean, you know, I have a master's degree in horticulture. I get a tomato to produce, and I'm like, <laughs> good job, Kelly. It just warning. feels good to, to yeah. watch things grow and produce something and have something be successful. Um, that's, yeah. well, and, that's my thing. I really and, love and it. putting in you know, putting in the effort over time too. Like it, it doesn't just happen overnight. You've got to take care of that plant for a while. I mean, it's, it is really fulfilling, you know? And I think that's probably why most, most folks like that that are tuned into our show because um, you wouldn't be tuned in and talking about this if you didn't. Right. Um, yeah. And they always fun. say, Candace, they always say, I'm not a gardener. I have a, I have a brown thumb. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is what I always say. Gardening is like cooking. If you don't put love into it, it's going to taste bad. I like that. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can't just throw food, you know, it's like when you're, when your mom is cooking, what's that? What's the, is your mom a good cook, Candace? I'm sorry. I don't mean to call her out. She that is. She doesn't funny. like doing it, but she is. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's like, you could take the same recipe and it just doesn't taste as good, right? Because it doesn't have the mom's love. Yeah. And so I think, you know, for us, it's like, I want to be around that plant and, 
you know, I'm not just, you know, watering it once, you know, one time and thinking I'm going to be a successful gardener. Right. Yeah, definitely. But really neat to see a lot of new people hopping into it. You know, that's kind of how we start on this topic. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, I'm sure both of you have seen that trend. I mean, that has been the trend the last two summers, just lots of new folks jumping into gardening, getting that awesome experience out of it. And um, I think that's going to continue to be a trend and how it, you know, impacts us as existing gardeners is there's, it seems like to me anyway, there's less supplies to go around these days, you know, it's <laughs> right. hard to find something as basic as tomato cages. I mean, we've kind of talked about on here seed shortages. Haven't, Candace, mm -hmm. haven't you already kind of ran across that this year? Yeah. Yeah. I just got my, the majority of my seed order in the mail uh, the other day, and I think I was able to get most of kind of what I was intending, but I also ordered these in, mm, might have been November, maybe December. So like I, I was probably a little bit earlier than kind of more of the beginner gardener might order, might order their seeds. So I think I was a little bit ahead of the, um, ahead of the game because I knew that because that was something that popped up in the last two years is that, um, We've got a lot more people ordering seeds, which is which is awesome. But it also means that we need to plan a little farther ahead if we're looking for something specific, right? And in the spring, you'll see all these articles and they'll come out with trendy vegetables and trendy perennials. And then you won't be able to find those plants <laughs> anywhere right? or yeah. be able to order them. So uh, sometimes I hate doing those types of presentations, the new and improved, because I want people to be able to find them. So, and that's mm -hmm. what why Candace, you know, orders her seed online because she's looking for a particular cultivar that grows a certain way. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, you know, I want to do seeds and peppers and containers this year. And I don't want to just go buy the seeds and peppers that I find in the industry. I want to buy more compact plants. Mm -hmm. So I have to order seed. Yeah. And I grow, I grew all ordered all flowers, of course. And so, for example, uh, marigolds, I'm going to expand kind of my marigold production this year because they were just the awesome last year. But I'm looking for a specific cut flower marigold that's going to have a 24 inch, 36 inch stem on it versus the typical kind of bedding plant uh, marigold that I would find at most kind of garden centers. So I'm definitely looking for kind of more specific. Yeah. Absolutely. But it does, uh, let's seem see. like, it does seem like some of the more run-of-the-mill stuff is, I wasn't seeing a shortage in like, yeah, marigolds are a good example. We mm -hmm. plant some of those that we buy as little plugs just around our vegetable garden for looks. Yeah. I, I was able to get those fine where it was maybe some of the, maybe not tomato plants, but some of the other vegetables that were a little more difficult to source as mm -hmm. seedlings yeah. as well as seeds. Yeah, definitely. Um, Laura asks, any great plans for raised beds and or potting benches? And I think I think that's definitely a trend too, is a lot of these newer gardeners are probably starting with raised beds or containers or kind of some of those easier yeah. things to get started with, you think? Yeah, I, ha I think I have a trend. So, of, of course, we sit here and we think what the trend is. Well, I really, yeah. like I'm the predictor of next year's trend. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think the, the reason Ryan and Candace, I, you know, are seeing these trends is because we interact with a lot of clientele. We see, mm -hmm. you know, these garden trend reports and we understand some of the industry and how they're doing yeah. And I'm telling you, I grew so many herbs last year. And when I couldn't grow them, I bought them at the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. And it was just because I changed the way that I used the herbs. You know, in the beginning, herbs was just a little bit to taste. And this, this past year, I was using herbs in huge quantities in my dishes. And when it's fresh, it's so tasty. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it wasn't like I wanted two or three leaves of cilantro or two or three leaves of basil. I wanted to harvest an entire plant every meal. So I was just growing herbs like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then another thing is I love incorporating some of those perennial herbs into the landscape and then for the bees, because, you know, the, the oregano's and the lavenders, 
you know, the bees love those little tiny flowers. And so even if you don't harvest, which a lot mm-hmm. of people do grow herbs and then they never harvest it, right? Or they'll never yeah, use I do. Yeah. I do That's that tremendous. too. I do every, well, I have good intentions every year. I fill a bunch of containers with herbs. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to cook with these. And then a lot of times I don't, but they look great in the container either way. So I don't really care. And I still enjoy they look great because I'm sorry, herbs are like the easiest plant in the world to grow. You can practically throw them on the ground. Don't water them. They'll be fine. Well, don't do that. (laughs) Plant them in the ground and give them water. But they're so easy to grow. And if you forget to harvest, you can just let them go to the flower and the bees will like them. But, you know, I grew many containers of cilantro, basil, parsley, time last year and I was just using it like crazy. Did you use a lot of herbs this past year in your cooking, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. We have a little herb garden outside our kitchen. And I, I mean it's definitely under harvested. You know, like like Candace, there's a lot of it. I mean, it depends on what I'm making. Like sometimes I'm into it and mm-hmm. I'm picking a lot, but um it, you know, we definitely don't get the use out of it that we could, but it it's also a nice little pollinator garden. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, we used a lot last year. We planted some extra basil was one that we added some extra plants. And that's just all in kind of a little landscaping bed right outside our kitchen door that it's mixed in. And, you know, we had extra basil plants that just got plunked in other empty spots. And, you know, not we typically make pesto with those. A lot of the basil we'll harvest is, you know, in a big chunk and make a giant thing of pesto. I mean, some of it we didn't get to and it went to flower and it, there you go. It's a pollinator plant out there and um, filled a nice spot in the garden as an annual for the year. And I, I don't regret it. You know, it's, I, I think there, it's, you know, we, we got a bunch, we planted it and if we didn't have time to harvest it, no sweat, you know, it's, yeah. it goes for another use in the garden as well. So. I did a lot of sensory play with Asher too. Um, just so you know, three-year-olds are normally little jerks and pull the plant out of the pot and then look at you like, what? What's wrong? (laughs) What happened? (laughs) And so, you know, I'd get him to tear the leaves off the basil plants and smell them. And he just really, really interacted with the plants. And I that made me feel like a good mom to get him some little sensory interacting with those herbs. Yeah, that's perfect. That's what you want. Cool. Okay. Well, if you guys have uh, trends you think are going to be coming up, let us know in the comment box. Or if you have gardening questions, let us know. We are happy to help. We are just going to keep chatting through kind of what we think uh, we're going to see this year. Because like Kelly said, we, we're we not experts, certainly, in this, in this field. But we do definitely, I think, have a pulse on kind of the industry based on what, what we're seeing. So, so far, we think the gardening craze is going to continue. Um, there's going to be shortages probably this year again, and you need to plan ahead. Um, and we were just talking about vegetable gardening and herb gardening. I think that's still going to be one of the more popular uh, kind of fields of gardening. That, And I think what's great about that is this is an easy starting point. You can start with one tomato plant and, and, and start there. It's a great way to, to get started. And I think another one that's a great place to start if you've never grown a plant before, of course, is houseplants, right? I think we all have seen uh, the houseplant craze, which I love because I, lo- I love houseplants. And we've we've talked about before how we're seeing all of these new houseplant stores popping up in our, our communities that weren't there pre-pandemic, which is really awesome. Um, so I think the houseplant trend is definitely going to continue. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah. No, can't even imagine. <laughs> Uh, but here, I wanted to show you. Remember the Venus flytrap? I mean, I know if you guys watched the Halloween show, we talked about Venus flytrap. Uh-huh. And I told you that I have to water it with a special water. And many horticulturists struggle doing mm-hmm. these um, uh, carnivorous plants. And so this is what it looks like. But hey, look, it's still alive. <laughs> it's flowering. And this is the other one. The other one has one trap left. Nice. And it's flowering. So uh, that was a very nice surprise. So uh, even though this is not going to stay around forever, I thought I'd share that flower with you guys. That's pretty good. That's probably longer than I've ever kept any of mine alive. So that's that's pretty Mm -hmm. good. I've been using rainwater. Okay, there you go. 
and mm -hmm. keeping it in the little thing that it came in to keep the humidity high. And I still have, you know, you know, if I'm gone from the office too long, it dries down a little bit. And I think that's mm -hmm. the problem is I let it dry down too much. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm super happy with myself. Yeah, let's let's see that flower again. That's I've never seen. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Well, it's just it's barely little, in bud. Yeah, cute. Yeah, pretty cool. Who knew? But that's also a sign that the plant's like, I'm going down. I need to survive. Let's yes. shoot up a flower, right? <laughs> that it, that when I saw the flower, I was super excited, but I was like, uh oh. Time to, to be done. It's, uh, it's going to die. Yep. <laughs> Real soon. But you'll enjoy it in the meantime. <laughs> but I will enjoy it in the And then, um, you know, I wanted to show, I got this plant. And I got this with yeah. Candace. I think we've already talked about it, but the, the I'm obsessed with these, you know, how, um, what was it, two years ago, I was obsessed with jungle cacti and couldn't mm -hmm. get enough. Now I have them all over my office. <laughs> now I'm obsessed with these string of... String of everything. And this is string of needles. Yeah. And it just like, how do you grow this plant? So what <laughs> I had to do was I use this... And I let it <laughs> drape over the top because normally nice. this would make a lovely hanging basket, yeah. right? Yeah. Just a really cool plant. It's got these weird um, growths on them. Oh, yeah. Huh. And I think, yeah, and I think you bring up a point that like, yes, the house plant kind of craze in general, I think is going to on a continuum. But what I've noticed is really interesting is that people are almost collectors. Like there's a lot more people like us who are very into a specific type of plant or group of plant, or they just want to collect kind of all the unique ones. So I think the trend of like unique houseplants mm -hmm. in, in particular is also going to be like, we've showed our our Raven ZZ plants several times because we both, Kelly and I both have one. I see hers back there. Uh, but just that dark, almost black uh, foliage, it just makes it unique versus your typical kind of ZZ. So I think those those okay. kind of things that set them apart are going to continue. Well, so I, I had to go out and get a black ZZ plant too. Oh, good. After I saw both of you had one. But interestingly, I had a sprig of green come up in mine. So. Ooh. What's I the wonder, explanation there? Well, I it's, wonder if it'll fade to dark as it. That's what I'm guessing. Uh, like as it as it matures, but I don't know. Yeah, I bet you're right. I bet you're right. I think. Yeah. 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 Or it could be a sport. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's cool. I'm seeing um, houseplants pop up in almost any store these days too. We've got your houseplant specific stores. And before that, you pretty much had to go to a garden center to get um, houseplants. But even the grocery stores, it seems like any, but any store is kind of hopping on the on the houseplant train. I picked up this um, hyacinth uh, bulb the other Ooh. day from a, a grocery store. And obviously it hadn't bloomed when I got it, but you can see it's just a hyacinth bulb sitting in, um, sitting in water just at the checkout at the grocery store. And I was like, Oh, for three bucks, I'm going to take that home and enjoy it. And I think, I think a lot of people are are doing that now that maybe hadn't before. And, um, they're able to enjoy that little bit of beauty in their on their kitchen counter. Yeah, you know, I really hadn't done uh, many forced bulbs like that, and did a couple. Like I got a paper whites thing and a master gardener thing back mm -hmm. in December, and we did those. And um, it, it's just pretty neat to have that. Um, Really yeah. nice looking flower this time of year on your counter. You know? Yeah, and the the smell, of course, from hyacinth is yeah, is, is super super good, which is nice. So, and then what could you do with that when you're done? Yeah, so I will let this kind of age, let the let the foliage keep growing. Once the flowers are done, I'll cut them off, and then I'll let the foliage kind of keep growing until the spring, and then I will plant that bulb in the ground, and hopefully next year it'll bloom out in my landscape. Or I could toss it if I didn't want to do that, but. Um, you can replant it if you want to. Hmm. I went to a rummage cell last year. I didn't go to a lot of rummage cells. I love them, but um, this girl had um, houseplants, and she had the labels with the cultivar names on them. 
Nice. Of course, I bought every single one. <laughs> because I was like, really? Nice. And it was just like, you know, she's just like, yeah, I just really got into it. And so she started propagating her plants and selling them at a, at a uh, yeah. product sale. Yeah. So well, I picture Asher walking back to the car with the tray full of plants. <laughs> with her mom. Heck yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is like using house plants, I think, in unique ways um, is going to continue too. So I showed the kokidama uh, before string gardening uh, is the easier way to say it, but kokidama I think is going to continue to be kind of a unique trend where you can take the the root ball of a, a plant, typically a house plant, and you can kind of manipulate it in kind of a bonsai technique. Um, and form it into a ball, and then you can hang that in the window or place it on a uh, on a tray. Um, there's a couple workshops I think coming up that people are are doing that, and I think terrariums too. That's neither of these are new techniques, but I think just the idea of using your house plants in non traditional ways, I think too, will continue to be um, a fun way to do it. Yeah. I have a terrarium. I didn't know we were talking. About. I was like, I got to show my terrarium too. The succulent terrarium that we nice. never water. I love this plant. It's called Euphorbia truchillae. And I actually went to go buy more of them. And they are really expensive. But yeah. if you pay the money, it's worth it. Because they are so easy to grow. Yeah. I love a succulent terrarium because it's just so low maintenance. That's the best. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We've had a couple of comments and questions. So let me scroll back up here. Uh, da -da. I saw one about house plants. Laura said Louisville has a great house plant store with cool and unusual plants. Definitely. Yeah, wherever, I mean, us three always, whenever we travel, we always uh, check out, <laughs> check out the local garden center. So definitely recommend that. Um, let's see. Uh, Karen had a good question. Uh, when to winter seed milkweed? I know kind of native plants is one of those ones you're going to touch on today, but if Karen wanted to seed milkweed, should she do it now? When should she do it? I, forgive me, Ryan, for taking your thunder, but I, it's about four to six weeks of fertilization that is required. I put my seed in the refrigerator for six weeks. And then when I go to germinate it, um, what I found is the um, the money is it needs warmth. If it doesn't have warmth, it's not going to germinate efficiently. Um, and the reason I did this was because I had, I had them germinating inside and I started in April. And it was just slow and it wouldn't germinate, it wouldn't germinate. And I was germinating many of them. And so I just like kicked them outside. Horticulturists do this all the time. Kicked them outside. <laughs> and once they got that warm temperature, they just germinated. Now, I personally, as a horticulturist, would germinate my seed before planting the plant in the ground rather than direct seeding to the ground. Just because I think, you know, when you direct seed and you start watering, how do you know what this seedling is versus a weed seedling? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was very successful in growing plugs last year. I just had to four to six weeks of fertilization and um, uh, warmth. I don't know about winter seeding. I mean, I know that you can, you know, some gardeners will actually throw seeds of milkweed mm -hmm. out into the garden during the fall. Yeah. And then in the spring, they'll start to see little sprouts come up. Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, and I would think if you did it now, you'd still get, I mean, four to six weeks, yeah. you would mm -hmm. still get enough mm -hmm. um, cold temperature. Yeah, sure. I've done it both ways, just spreading seed in a little patch. And I guess how I've done it is like, just use little stakes to mark mm -hmm. this patch and just try to get, you know, a good amount of seed in there. I don't know what a seeding rate for milkweed would be, but, yeah. um, and then, you know, kind of, let them come up and try to differentiate between weeds and, and maybe not let every plant in that patch if you get some good germination come up. But I found, I mean, with milkweed seed, in my experience, it's spotty, you know, it's not, it's not awesome germination all the time. And we've, we've done it in, we do trays of it. And my wife's a farmer, farmer's market manager. And for, um, you know, National Pollinators Week every year, she has 
those plants at the farmer's market maybe sells for a couple dollars, or I think sometimes they give them away. But nice. we did that for our own landscape, for her projects and things. And just, yeah, I, I, it definitely needs that cold period. Of course, we know that's a requirement. But even once you get them in the trays, I just, I plant more than I expect to need because I find some of it just mm-hmm. for me anyway, seed I collect and handle myself doesn't always all germinate. And I mean, I don't know what my germination rate would be. I mean, still probably up there pretty good around 80% or something, but it just kind of depends on how many plants you want and how many you want to plan for. So we're always kind of planting a little extra. And then, I don't know, there's a certain point in the summer where we have a lot of these little milkweed plants that just need to go in natural areas and other places and, you know, be planted out. Um, So we usually wind up with more than what we need just to have enough for kind of those community projects and, uh, we volunteer at the local conservation group that we plant some of those out too with, but um, nice. nothing special with those. We're doing them in trays outside. Um, I think there's we've started trays indoors before with grow lights, but not really necessary. But you know, you can get them going outside just fine as well. So there you go. So One Karen, of the, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Trey. No, go ahead, Kelly. Sorry. I'm actually going to experiment a little this year with mon- with milkweed seed. Um, You know, just in the past, when I go and do things or programs, um, passing out milkweed seed just seems like a win-win for everyone, right? And so, uh, you know, usually we, you know, promote swamp milkweed or butterfly weed or, you know, uh, trending lately has been that annual milkweed that you can buy as plants in the industry, but we were actually um, going to experiment a little bit more this year with some different kinds of milkweeds. And uh, I'm developing a handout, by the way, Ryan, so let me know if your wife wants to use it. <laughs> um, but we're thinking about, you know, working with prairie uh, milkweed, spider milkweed, which will handle a little bit more shade, um, showy milkweed, and world milkweed. So we're thinking about, like, you know, growing some of these other milkweed plants, getting them in our master gardener projects. That way we can generate more seed and not have to buy them every year. And then just continue to, you know, um, continue to, you know, spread the milkweed seed around. Um, I just thought it would be interesting to have a milkweed garden or something where we just, we go beyond swamp and butterfly weed. Um, but Yeah, there's so many that's- kinds. Yeah, that's a, that's what I was gonna say. It's a really good point, Kelly. Like I think lots. I mean, I used to only really think of common milkweed when somebody said milkweed, but there's 24, you know, different species of a couple different genera that are native to Illinois. I just gave a talk earlier this week to a garden club on the milkweeds of Illinois, um, and I'd say yeah, in my experience, the ones that I've planted the most are common milkweed, butterfly weed, and swamp milkweed. Those are the three that I've been able to like find at garden centers or plant Uh sales. Maybe world milkweed would be the next one I've maybe seen some of and have planted. But, um, you know, a lot of those other 24, you know, some of them are sensitive species. There's, uh, I think there's four off the list that are state endangered. One that's federally listed as endangered. So some of them are rare sensitive plants. And that's another point about milkweeds is that you know, I grew up here in central Illinois. Uh, My mom's side of the family farmed. I walked beans. I did farm work. And, you know, the target of that in the 80s was killing a lot of milkweed. So common milkweed to me seems like this weed of a thing. And so I never really thought about a milkweed being a sensitive species in a rare habitat. But, you know, there's a lot of them that make the list of sensitive species as well. So kind of a neat group of plants that, you know, span the air, you know, the the types of habitats in Illinois from the edge of an agricultural field, a really hard place to grow to some of the rare you know, hill prairies and barrens of of other parts of the state than here that, you know, are super yeah. rare habitats. So yeah. I, I think there's probably more on that list, Kelly. I, I love to hear that you're experimenting with some of those. I think there's probably more on that list than we see people, we see available there that we could probably pretty easily grow and enter our garden. So mm-hmm. that's cool. I'll be interested to hear what you, what kind of I'm a, come out of that. I'm a horticulturist who loves talking about plants that contribute to wildlife biodiversity and I think I've only grown four types of milkweed in my life so I'm I am very excited to do it and see the ornamental characteristics and be able to share that with everybody around me. Awesome yeah I know I was able to find a couple of those different ones at the local garden center this past 
season and I planted a couple, so I'm excited this spring to see see yeah, how they all one. did. Which one? I know I did World in Prairie for sure. I have to look and see if there was some of the others. Yeah. So yeah. And I've got a whole bunch more butterfly weed. I'm always adding more butterfly weed. No, so to see it. if it's a good cut flower. No. Exactly. <laughs> if it's a good cut flower, you just let me know. I'll put that on my uh, handout. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so another misconception with milkweeds, I'm surprised I ran across this question so much, is whether it's an annual or perennial. Mm-hmm. And, and really, all of our native milkweeds are perennials. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they die, die to the ground and come back the next year, but... It's funny because I see why people would mistake it for an annual because like the massive seed production, the fluffy seeds that disperse widely, you know, Mm -hmm. that's kind of what an annual plant wants to do is put out a bunch of seeds and come back the next year from seed as opposed to, you know, an existing root system. But um, yeah, I've had lots of people ask me the question, now I planted milkweeds this year, will those come back in my garden next year? And the answer is yes, unless they die over the winter for some reason or another, they should come back. Yeah. So just, yeah, be aware if, if that was ever a question for you. They're perennial plants. So once you add them, they should be around. around for well, a while. we'll see how mine did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. We've got some other questions coming in. Thank you, guys. So Amy asks, uh, we're planning on using long galvanized steel livestock tanks for container vegetables this year. Um, any helpful tips as we attempt this? Uh, two that came to my mind um, quick were to make sure to drill holes in the bottom so that there's drainage, plenty of drainage to go through. And you might even consider lining um, lining it with plastic also to keep one, just because of the material you never, especially if you're growing vegetables, you never quite know what could leach from the material into the soil. Uh, and then also I would think too, keeping the moisture off of the metal would help it last longer that was would be kind of my two things would be definitely make sure there's drainage and then maybe think about lining it with um plastic before you fill with um soil well, what about you guys do you have any thoughts for um yeah i mean i would talk i would th- think about succession planting and intercropping um mm-hmm. you know if you uh you know, know that you're going to plant uh, a pepper plant there. You know, you can't get that pepper plant in there till the end of May. But, uh, you know, starting late March, you can start growing, you know, a, a harvest of spinach. And then when it's warm enough, you just harvest your spinach and put in that pepper plant. Mm-hmm. Or if you decide, hey, I want to grow beets. Beets are a longer crop, and you can grow those with some parsley or some lettuce and harvest that first. So, um, you know, you, you have little space, but you can, you know, with succession planting, which means you plant right one after another, and intercropping, which means I plant the lettuce in with my beets, and when I harvest the lettuce, um, then I make beets to further expand um just a really great way of utilizing your space so really think about that you know mm-hmm. you don't only have to grow tomatoes and peppers mm-hmm. and you know a basil plant on the end but you can grow spinach and radishes and all of these um also and get a lot of food out of one mm-hmm. container or flowers also or flowers. <laughs> yeah. Flowers. yeah but yeah my my favorite thing about that type of container is you don't have to bend down. Like they're, it's going to be off the ground uh, a ways, which I think is just super handy. So it's a good idea. Okay, let's be interesting for potatoes too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know, it might not let the potatoes, it might heat the potatoes up faster. I was just going to say that. Yeah, it would be warmer, I would think. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's see. Mike asks, um, in 2023, we're going to be on the garden walk. Here in Monticello, we are wanting to have some cactus in our gardens. What are good cacti to buy that will survive in central Illinois? And then Carol actually replied and said, uh, prickly pear is supposed to do well. She planted some in the summer that she got from a friend and she had really good luck with them. And that's exactly what I was going to suggest too. I know we've talked about prickly pear on the show before. Brian, I think you've even shown how to uh, propagate it. I was like, wherever uh, did we get that idea? <laughs> right. And we get um, the prickly pear idea. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I have in my garden as well. That's the the one cactus for me that is a perennial and comes back every year. There's not really others 
I don't, yeah, I don't know of any others, honestly, yeah. that would sur- in in the garden that would survive besides prickly pear. So, I mean, yucca is, is technically a succulent or yeah. stems or yeah, yeah. It would give you that vibe. All too well, yucca. Mm-hmm. Yucca seems to. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Nina asks, um, "Are palm trees really indoor plants?" She said, "I've tried and failed every year to bring my outdoor palm in, and it never survives to next summer." Mm. What do we think? Temperature uh, or humidity? I, I was going to say humidity too. Yeah. I wonder if it just dries out too much. I mean, I, I've been shocked to like start to look at um, humidity indoors at our house and see how low it is in the winter time. Mm-hmm. Because, and it's just shockingly low, like thirty percent or below in the house. Where, you know, in the summertime, I mean, what's our relative humidity outside? Like. 100% sometimes mm-hmm. in the summertime, but still even in my house, it's not getting up much, like 50% relative humidity inside in the summertime is really high in my house. So, I mean, that's a big difference for a plant to be outside in like tropical, like steamy humidity in August and July and things, and then to come into that just drastically different. So, I mean, we've talked about this before. I mean, maybe it's a little more gradual of a transition you could try of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, bring, slowly bring it in for just kind of like you transition your plants outside a couple hours at a time of switching spots um, to try and ease it into it. But I, mm-hmm. I have not been very successful at finding a way to provide that adequate humidity in, inside in any way, really. I don't know. What have you guys? Yeah, I've never done palm inside, so I can't speak particular. But yeah, I would think humidity would be the biggest thing. And probably even light too. If you don't have like a, a good southern facing window that has enough bright light, I would think that would probably be a limiting fact, pretty limiting factor for that too. So maybe try if you do try it again, maybe try some different locations around the uh, around the house and see, and see how it does. One thing I think people, you know, again, normally, you know, uh, non plant people tend to overwater their plants because they don't check to see if the plant actually needs water and they just dump water on it. Yeah. But I think what we, we do is we think it's winter. I don't have to water my plants quite as much, but that goes back to Ryan's point. It, there is no humidity and you have that heater cranking. So actually I water my plants sometimes just as much during the winter because of that heat and that low humidity as I would if they were outside. Um, So I'm constantly checking my plants. I was was just going to say that you're checking before you're, you're doing it. You're really making, you're lifting it up, seeing what the weight is like, sticking your finger in the potting soil to to make sure it is actually dry before doing it. Yeah. So one of the things that people always, this is the question we get asked all the time. First of all, people always ask me if it flowers. <laughs> Anytime I talk about a plant, if it's a flower, if it's an angiosperm, it flowers. So if we're mm-hmm. talking about it, it probably flowers. Yeah. The, the question is, is the flower ornament ornamental? Okay. But one of the things that I do is I always check the bottom I'll stick my finger. This doesn't have a hole in the bottom, so I'm breaking yeah. the rules. <laughs> but I'll you can check take out. You can take I'll, out the yeah. one inside it, though. Yeah, I'll check yeah. the bottom, and if the bottom is dry, I'm ready to water. Because a lot of people will look in the top, and you know it may be dry the top inch, but the wet, the rest is wet, and you don't need to water it. So that's that's my you know that's. That's why I think I'm I think I'm good at growing plants is because I have a PhD in watering. And it's only because I used to work in a greenhouse. And those were the decisions I made every day. I so don't I plant, practice do water. I think those are really good, really good points on on checking. And I think a mistake I've made before is I check one pot and it's like, oh, that's dry. I better water them all, you know, because you want to kind of get it all done at once. But yeah, every pot is a different size. And if it's in a different location, it, it really, it's like each plant needs its own check. And that's what I think I've done before. It's just like, oh, one needs watering. I'm going to do them all today, you know, and that's not a good idea. 
Yeah. Especially, that's hard though when you have a lot of plants. You're like, oh, yeah. it's so much easier to do it all at once. <laughs> but yeah. it's not what I do. I mean, yeah. I check each individual plant. I mean, of course, if the soil is receding from the side of the pot, I don't have to check it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes but it's I do easy check to tell. each individual pot. Well, you know, again, you know, Candace and I used to work in a greenhouse where we'd walk into a room full of 80 different kinds of tropical plants in different sized pots. And we knew we couldn't just water the whole room. Do you know what I mean? We had to sit there and go, oh, this plant's good. I'll water this one, this plant. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's funny how over time, it, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but that potting soils, it gets old and crusty and things. It just doesn't hold moisture as well too. So like a lot that I repot, then it's like, oh my gosh, I haven't watered this for two weeks, you know? And it's because I don't have old crusty potting soil in there. Like, so it, you know, at the right time of year for plants, it's good to repot them and just kind of replenish the potting soil that's in there, if nothing else. Yeah. And I don't bump them up too much. Like I'll go from mm -hmm. a six yeah. to an eight, or I'll bump it up a little bit. My mother-in-law tongue is staying where it is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, yeah, I'll bump them up in the spring um, just because of the watering factor, because I don't want to have to water quite as much, but yeah. Or it's funny, sometimes the size pot they're getting repotted to is based on what's out in my garage is empty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, so I'll start doing True. one plant and it's like, oh, we should do that one. And then it's like, oh gosh, I didn't get a pot for that. And yeah, so I think a lot of times that's made it just be like a tiny size bigger, but yeah, I, I think... Uh, a, a bad mistake is going from tiny pot to like a big huge pot and i know a lot of people think like oh i'll just repot this plant once and you know this will be its, its size pot for the next 10 years but you know kelly you've talked about it before that can kill some house kill plants it. you know so it is not a good i mean you know clearly i mean you know it's just it's watering is so different i mean in the beginning you have to really baby it and then you have to manage that empty soil for such a long time you're bound to get disease and fungus gnats good recipe for fungus gnats <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> okay let's see i know we've had some other questions great questions everybody um let's see reva says um, i'm planning to create a multi-culture herb garden so that's awesome. She's an Asian, Italian, Mexican, and French provincial. Um, having, having difficulty finding seeds for things like Mexican oregano, tarragon, spicy basil, as well as thyme and sage variations. Um, any source recommendations? So we can't particularly share kind of one source over the other, but any general tips for her maybe to help find some of that stuff? And go to a higher end. You know, there's a higher end place. When we have several high-end greenhouses here in Bloomington, but one of them in particular just tends to have a better selection of herbs mm -hmm. and they really go crazy. And so, and they sell out. So mm -hmm. um, by the time you're, um, you know, you go early to get those. So I would say, and I was finding, you know, different kinds of thymes and lemon verbena and uh, lemon balm and patchouli. I was finding all these really unique sensory herbs there. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it just might be up to the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. I think it always pays to ask. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, I've been surprised at what garden centers and nurseries have come up with when I've said, oh, you know, I want a witch hazel or whatever it is that they don't have. And then they order, they can order it or get it, or you're at least putting in a vote for next year's inventory mm -hmm. <laughs> to say like they should have these other herbs. But yeah. anyway, always worth asking. Or they'll yeah. tell you to go to their competition. I mean, this happens to me all the time. I'll be like, yeah. oh, do you have this? Oh, we don't have it, but I know blah, blah, blah has it. You know, they just know what each other's selling. Yeah, and that's good. That means it's a good garden center, yeah. Um, I was going to tell you, too, to see if there's a local herb association, uh, too. I know in, in our area, there's a there is an herb association that does a sale every spring. So you might be able to find some interesting stuff through there, too. Um, let's see. Good questions. Um, Susan had a comment. She said, geraniums can be a great activity with children, can use to demonstrate evaporation and condensation. 
Awesome. That sounds like a cool activity. Uh, Brenda asked, ideas for the Annabelle hydrangea and preventing branches from falling and drooping. That's good. Hydrangeas are one of our favorite topics. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. got it. Any tips? What I've is it? A, Go ahead. Brian. A couple plantings of Annabelle at my house. That's probably my favorite um, hydrangea. Um, you know, I've done everything from uh, trying to prop it up with some little stakes um, and twine um, to not doing anything. I mean, that's kind of what I've done the last couple of years too. You know, just some pruning to shorten the stems can can help with that flopping over. So you've got maybe younger stems coming up out of the plant. So I like to do the um, removal of about a third of the biggest stems. Um, and I think that's probably been the most successful thing is when I when I have my act together and actually do the pruning. But also, I mean, I, I kind of like the the floppy look of it too. I mean, I guess it depends. Like some of the, some of them really do lay almost lay on the ground where my patch isn't quite like that. But yeah, doesn't it have something to do with watering? You know, it's mm. when they start lay, laying on the ground, they need more water. But yeah, um, you know, when 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 you prune an Annabelle hydrangea, which is a smooth hydrangea. Mm -hmm. You prune it in late winter, so, mm -hmm. and then you prune it to two feet, a third of the height for strength, like you said. Um, when are you going to prune yours? What's late winter to early spring? For you? Um, you know, I always think that now, you know, all this has to do with your time that's available. And so, so for me, you know, within family life and everything else going on, it's not always the perfect timing. But if I have everything squared away and I'm picking that perfect timing, I really like kind of the February range where we're out of like extreme cold where it's starting to starting to see a little bit of warming where you're going to make that pruning cut and pretty soon within four weeks or so, you know, that plant's going to start growing again. It's going to start waking up. It's going to start putting energy into healing those pruning wounds or sealing those pruning wounds over growing over those wounds. So um, I don't like to, you know, we say during dormancy is the best for most, for all woody plants because they're dormant, you know, you're disrupting less of their, you know, seasonal operation, you know, growth and everything. Um, but if you can time it, the best timing, in my opinion, is late in the year. So you don't have those wounds open all winter with nothing going on. And, you know, but you don't want those buds to be starting to swell at all, because that means that plants send energy up from the roots and starting to invest energy and bud development and other things. And when you snip off any of those stems, you're taking away some of its energy it need, it has stored from last year to, you know, to leaf out, to produce flowers and everything else this year. So um, that's, that's, it's kind of a fine line there. You're wanting to get as close to breaking dormancy as you can without having that plant break dormancy. If you're wondering, have, have buds started to swell? Um, you know, you can, a lot of times you can start to see the scales starting to spread apart a little bit, a little crack kind of forming in between them. A lot of times um, the tips, buds on the tips will start to swell a little bit before further down the plant. So you can compare buds along the stem to see if there's any difference, but usually you can kind of tell when buds are starting to swell or change a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my long-winded answer. There. Hey, Don't Brian, me. look what I have on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> I want to prune hydrangea fact sheet. There you go. So, I mean, I just want to say, you know, just two things really quick. Um, um, you know, you have to be able to identify your hydrangea before you can prune it because some hydrangeas bloom on new wood, just like the smooth hydrangea that Ryan talked about, the Annabelle. So he's going to prune it. It's going to produce new wood, new buds, and it's going to bloom. The panicle hydrangea also blooms on new wood. So those two, you're going to prune in the late winter. Now, some hydrangeas don't bloom on new wood. They bloom on old wood, which means they're going to bloom on, uh, you know, stems that were produced this past summer and winter. And if you go out there right now and prune them off, you, you've eliminated your floral show. And you don't go prune those until after they flower. Most of the times, these are the type we kind of don't, unless it's really congested or there's a lot of old growth or you need to shape it in some way. It's not really, you know, the standard to prune it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, if if you if if your hydrangea is fine, I don't know if I would necessarily just prune to prune, but if it you have a shape issue or perhaps um, a nutrient deficiency um, or you know problem with flowering, then maybe pruning is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's nice leaving uh, that timing is nice to be able to leave it until February, March, because then you still have that winter interest because most of the time you're going to have those flower heads mm-hmm. that are going to stick on and then you can kind of enjoy those for the winter. So if you prune it too early, you're also losing that whole uh, season too. And so, you know, the smooth hydrangea, if you go through and deadhead it, do you ever do this with your Annabelles? Do you ever deadhead your Annabelles to try to get them to rebloom? Uh, not really. I haven't. Mm-mm. I mean, I harvest the flowers to bring inside. Yeah, same. That's not I really Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully that helps you. Um, but we didn't talk about we didn't talk about varieties either. It doesn't help you once it's planted. But if you're planting a new Annabelle, um, a lot of the newer cultivars now are bred for the purpose of having mm-hmm. kind of stronger branches that don't have as much drooping. So that's something to think about too. Yeah, and some of them are actually reblooming, which means they bloom on new wood and old wood. So don't go with these older hydrangeas just go with all the new trendy ones <laughs> they have better disease resistance you know there's some that are super compact now are you going to find them the middle of june at your local flora uh, garden center absolutely not when do you need to get there ryan as early as possible this year mm-hmm. yep early in the year i i know yeah. i waited till later in spring to try and get some stuff that was just gone I mean, ahead. Yeah. and, and, you know, uh, it's not that the garden centers aren't trying to keep up. I mean, they might, they have supply issues. I mean, if they can only buy so many dura- um, hydrangeas, that's all they can buy. Um, you know, uh, Ryan, you were talking about, um, you know, people who are interested in landscaping type of services that we never addressed. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I guess what I've seen, at least in the Champaign-Urbana area, is that um, I think it's pandemic related. A lot of us are at home and are sitting around in our backyards wanting it to look n- nicer or cooler. And gosh, we hit about June or so last year, and a lot of the landscape companies around Champaign-Urbana were booked. It was hard to get very big projects done and, and not just plant. I mean, I'm talking anything from planting a single tree to hardscaping type projects. I needed to have a patio done that um, was really hard to get worked in last year because of all the demand. So I guess the recommendation is if you know right now that you're going to need some landscaping help this year to really get on the schedule as soon as possible so so you're not passed up in the summer rush this year. So that was a surprising spinoff of the pandemic we hadn't thought of. Plan ahead for everything, basically, is the message. (laughs) Get it early. Okay, let's see. We've got a couple more questions to get before we wrap up. Um, Oh, Susan had a follow-up comment that was supposed to say terrarium instead of geraniums. Reactivity with kids. That makes more sense, Susan. I I, I was was like, yeah, geraniums are pretty easy to grow. Can't be geraniums. (laughs) Awesome. Um, Let's see. A couple suggestions for C recommendations. So thank you guys for chiming in. Um, Okay, we've got a couple other ones from... Um, YouTube. Um, Nicole says, I'm going to try my hand at growing plants from seed uh, for the garden, especially vegetables. Do you have any recommendations for the best setup to start your seeds? Are these seed starting kits any good? So we got um, five should, minutes left. Any quick You tips? should read my blog, my Flowers, Fruits, and Frost blog, and I have a I do a seed article every single year. I have this starting seeds like a professional and I just tell you exactly how I started seeds when I was in the greenhouse and, um, you know, covering them with the plastic and being super careful in my watering. And so that would be a great article to read. And I suggest that you go for it and have fun and, you know, um, don't get discouraged um, because one of the things that is noted that I've just noticed is some seeds they'll they'll practically jump out of the pot in a day or two. Some take a lot longer to germinate. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And read the packet too. So, you know, mm-hmm. kind of that a little bit ahead of time. I was just looking at, looking at mine and I need to kind of get them organized by the ones that I need to point start eight weeks ahead and the ones that I need to start 10 weeks ahead and kind of time them out. Yeah. I'll get my plastic inserts and then I'll, you know, do my little divot and I'll put two seeds per hole. But one of the things that I've been doing lately is I'll get like, you know, what the strawberry, what's the con- plastic containers called? Clamshells, like the strawberry mm-hmm. clamshells. Well, I'll just put soil in it. Yeah. I'll just dump seed on top of it, water it like that. And then I'll just gently tease the seedlings apart and either pot them up or plant them in the ground. And even though it's sure. got to be careful with the watering in the beginning, it's just a really easy way to start a lot of seed. Yeah, it's faster yeah. than doing individual. Yeah, I, th- I think a mistake I made beginning out, beginning and seed starting of vegetable plants is that I thought I could do it in my south facing windowsill, and I just never. I mean, tried that for a couple of years, and I had really, really good south facing, like you know, floor length windows, and even rotating and turning and things. I think it wasn't until I got overhead like grow lights that it really was worked out for me, and so. <laughs> Um, they don't have to be anything fancy. I build a set of grow lights out of scrap wood and just, you know, two, the big long tube, tube lights, you know, bought some cheap fixtures for that where, um, you know, you can nowadays, if you want to spend the money, you can buy really nice racks that are on wheels that have the lights built in and everything. Um, so there's a lot of options, but it doesn't have to be a super expensive light setup if you're willing to, you know, scrummage for some materials and make it yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah that's what that's what I'll be doing probably the next couple of weeks. So I just have a basic metal rolling cart and the super basic fluorescent lights that I zip tie uh, to the top. And yeah, it'll go in the garage, which is heated, of course. But yeah, it's, that's how I'll. Get my it's not about the light during germination; it's about the heat. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, it's yeah. not that he's not getting enough light in his south facing window. He wasn't getting enough heat to get those seeds germinate. Now, after the seeds germinate, the light is very important Mm -hmm. or you'll get really leggy, crazy looking plants. Um, But that's why fluorescents are working for them because it does put put up a bit of heat in the beginning. And sometimes in the greenhouse, we use these heating pads underneath our seed flats. And you can find those in the industry just fine. But, you know, stuff like marigolds and zinnias, don't even waste your time. Yeah. Tomatoes, eh, you're fine. But, you know, maybe uh, peppers, a little bit more difficult to um, germinate. I would baby them a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But you would not believe how many 17-inch tomatoes I see. <laughs> People, you start your tomatoes too early, way right. too early. I mean, if you're going to plant your tomatoes on May 15th or June 1st, which is the standard time for warm season vegetables, I mean, you're not going to start them in February. That's just way too early. Mm -hmm. You're just going to have to struggle with these, keeping these tomatoes going. Yeah. 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 I'd almost have a, I'd rather have a smaller transplant than having a super leggy because then it's just, it's just off to a not great start. For me. I'm four to six weeks. I want to plant this big mm-hmm. when I plant, when I transplant it into the garden or the pot. I don't want big, huge plants. Okay. Yeah, definitely, Hopefully. definitely a mistake I made. Starting them too soon because you think you're getting them getting ready early. And while my plants were leggy, I just had my whole grow rack was just a jungle. And then what I planted out there was not as good of a plan as if I had something smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good points. And when you plant your tomato plants, you plant them up to the top two leaves. So if you have a 14 inch plant, you're going to dig a 12 inch hole (laughs) and you don't put that whole tomato because it's a vine and it will create root initials along the entire vine. So you need to plant your tomatoes deep and the deeper you plant, the better off you'll be. Yeah. Just don't do that with everything else. Just tomatoes. Yeah, just tomatoes. <laughs> just vine okay. the tomatoes because they have the root initials on the vine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. We'll finish it off. We've got one other comment. Um, KC commented over on YouTube, said they like seeing all the house plants on the show. Awesome. Um, she said she said they've had a, a favorite plant that was a piece slowly that belonged to their grandmother who died in 1973. So... 
Love that sentimental. Wow. Love sentimental wow. We need to impressive. propagate that plant. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that is a awesome. very well, long-growing plant. That's that's impressive, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank you guys for your awesome questions today. Great comments, a little chat. And we didn't get to a ton of the trends, but just your questions alone kind of give us a peek at at what's going to be popular in gardening this year. But we will be back in about a month. So February 17th will be our next show, same time, same place. Um, but we're going to be talking about garden planning and scheduling. So getting into um, all of that. Um, make sure you check out our Facebook group as well. We have a University of Illinois Extension Horticulture Facebook group, and we'll get the link for you in the comments. So if you have questions between shows, you can head there. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next month and stay with the plants. Enjoy some, some gardening inside. We'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. See ya.